Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Nick and I work at EF Education First. I'm your moderator for this educational session entitled Voice of My Country, the Inaugurations of George Washington. This session is presented by folks from the education team at George Washington's Mount Vernon. As your moderator, I will be keeping an eye on the chat and although I will be off screen, I will still be accessible for the remainder of this session and standing by. So now it is my pleasure to introduce your facilitators, Jeremy Ray and Sadie Troy, who I will turn things over to right now. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Jeremy Ray. I'm the Director of Interpretation at George Washington. And as I mentioned before, I'm joined by my friend Sadie Troy. Hi, Sadie. Hi, guys. Uh, as Jeremy said, my name is Sadie Troy. I am our Student Learning Specialist in our Education Department uh, at Mount Vernon. Um, Jeremy and I are so excited to be here talking with you all on this um, historic, on this exciting um, Inauguration Day. While um, while we wait for everyone, I know that we're getting started in, in just, a, or as we get started and people still kind of come in, I am going to add in, I'm gonna put a little poll here um, on, uh, um, that I would love to answer um, and be honest. Um, oops, here we go, I'm, um, you can probably hear me typing, um, but just so we can understand and get to know you guys a little bit more. Um, I'm doing such a good job on this. But this is just going to show um, this chat and these polls are going to be open throughout the entire session. Jeremy and I are going to be moderating them and looking over. Nick's going to be looking over. So if anyone has any questions throughout as we talk about different items, um, please feel free uh, to type in the chat and we will, um, just like Jason Kim did. Uh, hi, Jason from Oregon. Uh, and we'll, we'll answer your questions and we'll talk through. We have some things to talk about, um, but we do have time for Q&A at the end. So go ahead and start filling out that poll. How many presidential inaugurations have you watched in your lifetime? Was this your first one that you saw? Have you, did you, have you seen two before, three or more? Um, Tell us, tell, uh, give us the answer. Jeremy, what's your, uh, what's your answer to the polls here? Well, I, I have seen many, 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 uh, dating back to uh, President Clinton, I believe was the first one that I, that I remember watching. So it is, I've had, a, I've had a few uh, in my time. Good, good. And I hope you have a lot more. I mean, <laughs> it's, they are fun events. I think that Clinton's second was the first one that I really kind of remember, um, paying attention to because just with all, you know, there were flags, there was music. Um, it was it was just a great spectacle of an event. I'm going to see if we have any have any answers to our poll. OK, but um, oh, I'm looking at the chat. We have a lot of people. We have Oregon, Maryland, California, Mississippi joining us. This is awesome. We're going the whole coast. Um, and we do have a great program today. We are here to talk about the inauguration. Um, we are here to talk about the legal requirements of it, how inaugurations came to be, why they are such public, uh, public spectacles. Um, and Jeremy and I are going to be doing all this uh, by examining the inaugurations of George Washington. Um, so we're all kind of going to be looking at through um, the lens of his inaugurations, because being the first, um, a lot of what we see today started over 200 years ago with, with Washington. Um, isn't that right, Jeremy? Yes, absolutely. And uh, if you were watching live today, you heard George Washington and his inaugurations, particularly the concept of the spectacle of inauguration come up a lot. Um, I've been watching since you know, about nine, nine o'clock this morning, and I was surprised at how often they kept referencing back to George Washington. So I think first off, I'd like to start out and, and talk a little bit about George Washington's first inauguration. So the first inauguration ever held uh, by the country uh, for the office of the presidency under the current constitution. Uh, so George Washington actually found out, he was informed by the Secretary of Congress, Charles Thompson, 
that he had been unanimously elected the president in April of 1789. Uh, now, he was unanimously elected in that he received every possible electoral college vote uh, for the office of the presidency uh, for his first term. Uh, they actually left together towards New York, departing Mount Vernon on April 16th, 1789. And what's really interesting is that everywhere he went, every city that he went through, there was an organized kind of public spectacle. Many of these individuals um, were, were, were trying to organize a way to welcome Washington, to really give legitimacy to uh, him as our first president and also this new found government. An example of that, actually, if you give me one second, I'll try to share, share a screen here. There we go. Um, one of those examples, whoops, wrong one, excuse me. Didn't give me the example uh, difference. It looked exactly the same. There we go. Just only showing how good at technology you and I are. We're both we're oh, absolutely. It. We're doing everything virtually now for a year. You think I'd I'd get it down, but I'm an old, so it takes me a while. All right. Uh, so one of those examples uh, actually was uh, at Trenton. It was a famous site of. of multiple uh, victories during the Revolutionary War. But we can see here uh, an image from uh, a magazine that dates back to actually 1789, uh, and it shows the city of Trenton over Aspen Creek. And there was this bridge and an archway, a triumphal arch. And then supposedly there was some sort of mechanism that lowered a laurel wreath that landed on Washington's head uh, as he crossed the, uh, crossed the bridge. Now, Washington, of course, just fought in an army to try and remove a monarch. And he very quickly, again, according to legend, removed this laurel wreath from his head, trying to not show any trappings of monarchy or anything. Um, all of this culminated, of course, with uh, a barge ride across the river into Manhattan itself. New York City was the first capital of the United States. And on the barge, uh, there were flags and decorations that represented all of the states of the Union. All of this was very public. And the idea of making the spectacle was intentional. This was the way of bringing legitimacy to the authority of the new government. And these large public gatherings helped to bring a sense of power and gravitas to what Washington was going to do. And the public participation part tied the people to that authority. And we'll, we'll get to that a little, bit, a little bit more. Now, April 30th itself was the day set for Washington's inauguration. And once again, we see a very highly coordinated public display, keeping in line with everything that we just, we just discussed. At sunrise, there was a military salute uh, that was fired uh, from Fort George, uh, which was, this is obviously an older uh, painting as we see British flags, but it's really the only known painting to exist. Uh, but that was kind of starting the event. It's, it's in a way, it was waking up the town and the surrounding areas to say, all of this is about to start. At 9 a.m., church bells rang for half an hour, and church bells played a very important part in announcing public news in the 18th century. Uh, oftentimes, there was something big that they wanted everyone to know about. The churches would ring their bells, would bring everybody out into the town uh, center, and then an announcement would be made. And in some small towns today, uh, church bells play a very significant part. My, my grandfather uh, vividly remembered all of the church bells ringing in his town when World War II came to an end for example. Uh, at 1230, there was a military uh, parade and escort uh, from the Franklin House where Washington was residing to bring Washington by horse and carriage to Federal Hall. And there were 500 soldiers in various ceremonial uniforms to escort the president-elect uh, to Federal Hall, which we see here. At one o'clock, Washington arrives and enters the Senate chamber, where he's greeted by both house of, houses of Congress. And he is formally welcomed and uh, by John Adams, who was his vice president. After a meeting of Congress, Washington adjourns, adjourns to the balcony, which you see up here in the front, where the Chancellor of New York, Robert Livingston, administered the oath of office. Washington took his oath on a Masonic Bible that was acquired from St. John's Lodge and was held by Samuel Otis of the Senate. He was the Secretary of the Senate. And what I'm about to show you here this is an image from our education center here at Mount Vernon. So hopefully as the pandemic winds down and in the future, you will be able to come out and visit us here 
And you can see these recreations, life-size recreations of George Washington here, taking his oath of office. After taking the oath, Washington bent to, to kiss the Bible while, um, while Livingston turned to the crowd and exclaimed, long live George Washington, president of the United States. Washington then turned and delivered the first inaugural address. And then after that, he attends a divine service at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. Uh, after the church service, he went to his residence where he died alone. Oops, excuse me, went a little bit too far there. Stop. Doesn't seem to be stopping the channel. All right, there we go. We're back here. Uh, so after after the, uh, the dining at his residence, New York City itself then opened up a massive fireworks display. I uh, went off for a couple hours and watched and viewed this with Robert Livingston and his future Secretary of War, which are which is the predecessor to our modern uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, it was Henry Knox, who was a general who fought with Washington during the Revolutionary War. So Washington tried to take a carriage home from the Livingston's res residence, but there were so many people who were out as part of these inauguration celebrations and events that he couldn't ride his carriage back. He actually had to walk home. Uh, so Sadie, what, that's what happened on Washington's first inaugural with the main theme being how each step was a coordinated public display. But what does the constitution actually require as the process for inaugurating a president? Um, yeah, Jeremy, I'm so glad you asked that. And actually I went ahead and for all of our students who are here with us, I put that question in the chat. Um, Cause I'd love to hear your, uh, your guess on it. Um, because as you just went through, Jeremy, you talked, um, you know, Washington met with members of Congress. Um, he, he took um, an oath of office. He gave an inaugural address. You're saying all these things that we just watched. I'm pointing at my TV that's out in the corner that we just watched President Biden do, right? We just, so, so I'd love to hear from our students. How much of that do they think is in the constitution? Um, and uh, the votes are coming in. Um, and I don't know if you guys can see the results, but actually the one that's in the lead um, is the right, is the correct answer. Um, Cause some of students may be surprised, even though there are so many things that happened in Washington's presidency or Washington's inauguration that we just saw today. Um, there's actually very little written in the constitution um, that's actually required about the inauguration pra uh, process. Um, so the things like meeting with Congress beforehand or giving the big inaugural address or making it this big public display, all of this is extremely important to the inauguration, but it's not the exact purpose of this event. Um, you know, the purpose of this event is really for that oath. Um, and actually students, um, since you guys are doing so good at voting um, in the polls, go ahead. Can people type in the chats? Um, explain to us what an oath is. What are what do we say when the purpose of the inauguration is to take an oath? What is an oath? I'm gonna give a minute because I can hear him typing. Zoya's got it. It's a promise, right? That's awesome. That's a great way to describe it. Anna has the exact same idea. It's like a promise. That's absolutely correct. Um, and the promise that our um, president gives during the inauguration is a promise to the Constitution. We actually have it. Jeremy's going to pull up an image. But the purpose of the inauguration is to fulfill the requirement in the Constitution that the chief executive, so the president, must swear an oath um, to uphold the Constitution. And here we have one of my favorite things in the world, the primary source, um, where you can kind of see it written, but I have it closer if we put in the next image here to where we can really see the one sentence in the entire Constitution, the one sentence in, within all of the different articles that explains what legally needs to happen with what we just saw. And that is before he can enter uh, on the execution of his office, he should take the following oath. And that is as that is uh, as simple of a purpose, um, and it is that simply written out. This is in Article Two, Section One, Clause Eight of the U.S. Constitution. We all saw it. Um, 
So I hope you all can read it and understand it um, to really explain what this oath says in the Constitution. And as we know, the Constitution is the document that lays out the roles, it lays out the responsibilities of the United States as granted through the people, right? People have the power um, within our government. Um, when we look back at Washington's inauguration and his time as president, um, we really see the importance uh, that the importance that he puts on establishing the legitimacy of this document, right? Washington's the very first. This Constitution um, is brand new. And so Washington sees his duty, not just to help people understand his role of president, but to really help legitify uh, or this document and really help the people understand the roles of the government. Um, and we're seeing that this document that we're looking at, this is Washington's own copy of the Constitution. You can see he signed his name in the book. Um, this was given to him. Uh, and we can see immediately um, that it became an important reference to him. Not only does he sign his name in the book, but he goes through with the Constitution article by article uh, writing in the margins, making notes on his jobs and responsibilities. If you see these slides that are up, this is one of my favorite primary sources of all time. But these images that are up, you can see Washington required president, president. He's writing these. These are in Article 1. This That's Section 1. That's for the, the legislative branch. But he's going through. He puts margins in Article 2 as well. Um, so he's laying out. He's trying to understand. He's looking at his job description. He's making notes. What can he do? What can he not do? What's required of him? What must he do? What does he still have questions on? What checks and balances are coming in between the different branches? It's very serious, his role in establishing the legitimacy of the Constitution because he just swore an oath to it. An oath, Jeremy, I want to point out that he was so serious about making um, that he was so nervous no one could hear him when he took it. It was that quiet and it was that big of a deal to him. Um, but as we understand now, constitutionally what's required of the oath, let's bring it back a little bit more to Washington, um, you know, and specifically talk us through how he satisfied the constitution by taking that oath. But then let's broaden it out. Why make it public? Because being public is not written in, in the document. So why make that such a big deal? Yeah, I think that's a very good, a very good point to bring up. Uh, so as we we went back and just review uh, the inauguration process itself, the swearing in, right, the the constitutional requirement. Uh, we know that Washington swore an oath uh, on on a Bible before the before Robert Livingston, who was the Chancellor of New York. Now President Biden just was sworn in by Chief Justice uh, John Roberts. Right. So why? Mm -hmm. I have a question here, Sadie. Maybe maybe you could put it in a poll, and let's see if our uh, if our if our students can can answer it. But why do you suppose George Washington was not uh, sworn in by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Any ideas? I, you could probably just put it in the chat if you have an idea. You want to take a guess? Exactly. Anna's got it perfect. There wasn't a Supreme Court at that point. One of the jobs of the chief oh, great. I'm glad that you're using this yet. is to actually nominate. Yeah, is going to nominate the Supreme Court justices. So at that point in time, there weren't any. So uh, Robert Livingston being the chancellor for New York is effectively uh, for that city, for that place in time, was kind of the highest judiciary figure um, available. Right. Uh, so Washington is president had not nominated him for the judiciary at the point. And the Constitution provides no requirement, actually, that an oath or affirmation take place on a Bible or a religious text. Um, so when we're talking about a, a, a promise, right, the definition of the word oath is a solemn promise before a divine presence. So that is often why uh, you see presidents uh, choose to do this on a Bible. George Washington chose the Bible, though interestingly enough, he did not have one 
present initially. And the one that he used, the, the one from St. Uh, John's Lodge, the Masonic Lodge, was a last minute substitute. Um, Watts himself was a member of the Masons, right? Uh, today, many representatives have sworn oaths on various religious documents like the Bible or the Quran. And actually, some people have actually chosen to just affirm uh, on something else, right? In fact, President Franklin Pierce broke tradition when he did not swear an oath. He actually affirmed uh, that he would uphold the Constitution. So there's even a precedent, even amongst presidents of the United States, of doing that uh, affirmation instead. Now, the Secretary of the Senate was Samuel Otis. He's the one who actually held the Bible. Again, there is no provision of this that, that's mentioned, but these choices, I think, were intentional by Washington because they, they serve as a means of showing the equivalence of the three co-equal branches of government. Otis represented the legislative branch as the secretary for the Senate. Livingston, the judicial, even though it wasn't in place yet. And of course, Washington is the executive. Today, it is most common for a president's spouse to typically hold uh, whatever they're affirming or swearing, swearing an oath on. As we saw, it was Dr. Jill Biden who held the Biden family Bible uh, for President Joe Biden today. Uh, this was not a, an option for President Washington, though. Any, any idea why uh, Mrs. Washington did not hold the Bible for the president? You want to oh, guess? That's a good question. I'll make it easy. She wasn't there yet. Uh, she still hadn't <laughs> departed from Mount Vernon yet uh, to take up residence up in New York. Uh, so that was a little bit. A she little missed bit. the fireworks? She she missed the fireworks. She missed she missed all of it. She would actually come and join uh, in the summer when the travel conditions were a little bit uh, easier. And actually, I want to I forgot here to, to share real quick. Uh, just just as a reminder that this is the recreation. So this is Robert Livingston here on uh, the left administering the oath. Samuel Otis here in the middle, and of course General Washington there on the right hand side to give us a little bit more of that visual okay um now to the second part of your question why was this also public the reason for all of this being public is for accountability everything washington is doing is in is out in front right there's no secret swearing ins anywhere right washington was keenly aware that the power of the executive was derived or it came from the voice of the people we saw how seriously he took his duties when, when Sadie showed us the uh, annotation, annotated version of his constitution. Everything he is swearing he will do to uphold the constitution was not done in private. It was done so that the people were there to see him and could hold him to account. He's not just making the promise right, to divine a higher being, right? Not swear, just swearing an oath to, to uh, 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 his, his own personal dictates of conscience, right? He is making this promise to everybody who's part of the nation. And we do this today. The inauguration is televised worldwide. All of you got to watch it live, right? With the pandemic and everything going on, it was a little bit different this year, but it still was a very publicized event. We have pundits who dissect the platforms, promises, and form the citizenry so we can hold our representatives to accountable to these promises. And Sandy, this is not just speculation for me, you know, the director of interpretation of Mount Vernon, a public historian here in 2021. I think you actually have something from George Washington himself that proves that this theory is correct, right? Absolutely, I do. Uh, so yes, we are going to turn to another primary source because that is uh, one of my favorite things. Um, and I, I want to show you guys that Washington himself very much understood that the power of the government lies within the people. All right. He used his second inaugural address to call on the American people to utilize that power every day, um, not just in elections, right? Not just to cast your vote, but to really use your power to understand the government, the roles that our representatives um, are playing and the jobs they are doing for the people, for us. Um, and we see this um, after Washington took the oath of office for the second time. Um, so we're looking at his second inaugural address. Uh, Jeremy put it on the screen for us. And this is something not that we've clipped together or made smaller. This is Washington's entire second inaugural address. Um, the part I want to read, though, 
The important part is the highlighted area. So I'd love for you all to kind of look at that um, and really, um, you know, really read what he writes here. Um, because Washington is asking the people to be watchful of his administration and his presidency, right? We're looking at the quote that's in the second half, you know, that if I shall not be found, if, or that if it shall be found during my administration of the government, that I have in any instance violated willingly or knowingly the injunctions thereof, I may, besides incurring constitutional punishment, be subject to the upbraidings of all who are now witnesses of the present solemn ceremony. Okay. Um, you know, he's using language terms that we don't really use anymore. We don't really use upbraidings anymore, but read the context of the sentence. Can anyone tell us in the chat, you know, by saying I may be subject to the upbraidings of all who are now witnesses what are what do you think he's saying? What is he calling out there um, for these citizens? I like how Jeremy just put it in the chat. What does upbraidings mean? So as you think about it, you know, be the subject, you know, I may be the subject to the upbraidings of all who are now witnesses, being the people to hold him accountable. He is asking the American people to be watchful of his administration, of his presidency. He is asking the people to understand, to read the oath that he is taking and be the ones to make sure that he fulfills it, right? He's asking these individuals, if something goes wrong, hold me accountable, um, you know, censor, uh, call out the misgivings that I am doing. Um, you know, he is asking the people to stay in stay involved in politics beyond the election, because if he should fail at fulfilling his promises, they're the ones with the powers to call him out. They're the ones with the powers to put him um you know, and, and make him defend his actions. Um, you know, not only is he giving this address the day of, Zoya, I think that that's a great question about how many people were present at the ceremony. Um, and we don't have exact numbers. So we don't know how many people would have heard Washington's speeches in public or in person. So what they do is they print them in the newspaper the next day. And those newspapers are all around the country so that not just the people at the ceremony become the witnesses of the solemn ceremony, but the entire nation does. And that's what we do today, and it's more important than ever. People couldn't travel to the inauguration and see it in person today, but through live stream videos, radio broadcasts, write up in the newspaper, the entire country once again gets to become the witnesses. And we are put on with that same responsibility to understand our government, the oaths that our elected officials are taking so that we can use our voices and hold them accountable when their actions don't match that oath. So that's a lot in looking at Washington's presidency and his inauguration and the importance of it and what we can learn from that public spectacle. Um, are there other questions that people have? Um, Zoe had a great one. We're happy to answer any others as well. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, hopefully this uh, explains a little bit about why the spectacle is so so public. Again, just to reiterate, it, it was one initially for Washington's to give legitimacy to the government itself in this new system, but more importantly, to create this system where our elected representatives were held accountable to the promises that they were making and being respectful of the power that was being imparted on them from the people. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat. We'll do our best to answer. I, I think we've got a couple more minutes before uh, the session ends, um, unless Nick says otherwise. 
Yeah, he's the real boss here. He holds us accountable. Oh, great. He did give us a few minutes. Great. So we have about 10 more minutes. Now, Jeremy, I do have a question um, that maybe you can ask about Washington's whole trip up um along um i mean you know just because we've seen you know we think of kind of presidential entourages um do we know anyone who would have traveled with him who would have been that close um you know part of the ceremonies with him um throughout the event um or throughout that whole week of travel uh, you know just you know more so than just um uh the secretary who came in and provided him with the with the with the news. Uh, yeah. So, so of course, with the the secretary Charles Thompson, who who went with Washington in the main carriage, it was interesting enough that Washington himself had to uh, contract and kind of hire out uh, these carriage rides up. And and ironically enough, he had to secure a loan from a neighbor to even be able to afford to do that. Uh, it was kind of really like, yeah, one of those overlooked uh, items in history. Is he he of course was still in the process of of rebuilding uh, the farms and the plantation that he, he lived and worked on after the Revolutionary War. Um, so it was not uh, a huge entourage like we would think uh, today. There wasn't like a large uh, armed guard or anything. Uh, it was mostly his own uh, travel and oftentimes um, soldiers from the militia uh, for that uh, now state would often ride out and meet Washington and kind of lead the procession through uh, the various cities like in Baltimore and crossing over to um, Georgetown, which eventually would uh, be subsumed into the federal city that we know as Washington, D.C. today, uh, Trenton, as as mentioned before, in Philadelphia. Um, but what often gets overlooked, of course, is that obviously traveling with Washington were enslaved individuals, most likely um, uh, William Lee, who was Washington's personal valet, an enslaved man. Uh, so how the process worked is that Washington would ride in the carriage a little bit more comfortable with Charles Thompson, uh, frankly, the coachman and so forth would be there. But as he approached the town, uh, Washington would have his uh, one of his ceremonial horses, a, a white horse known as Blueskin, that he would hop on and then ride through the town up ahead of this procession as he went through, knowing that everybody wanted to see and, and wave. Um, another interesting aside is that Mount Vernon today, we're a private nonprofit organization. We're owned and operated by a group called the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And at Trenton, Washington was greeted by a group of young uh, women. And one of those women was actually a future uh, vice regent or a member of the Vi uh, Mount Vernon Ladies Association. So there was has been at least one individual who actually saw George Washington in her lifetime uh, that is related to uh, Mount Vernon and, and all of that. So kind of an interesting side of story, but much, much smaller Every than, we, than we see today. Wow. Well, thanks for answering that. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions from from our audience. So um, if we, we want to, I mean, I, I think we should go ahead and give them a break. If the next se uh, session at the main stage starts at 155, we can go ahead and kind of give them five minutes to collect themselves, rehydrate. Yeah, that sounds good, Sadie. Exactly right. So um, thank you both so much for that presentation. It was very informative. Um, as always with the Mount Vernon um, crew, anytime I've been down there on, on EF trips or, or just in, interacting with you guys, it's, it's always great to hear from you. So um, thank you so much. Um, as I said, we do have a couple minutes. 155 is when we are meeting again on the main stage for a conversation with Rachel Pittman. So until then, feel free to take a break. Um, you can check out Expo Booths. You can continue watching the inauguration live stream, or you can get up and do some jumping jacks, whatever you feel like you need to do right now. Um, but we will see you again on the main stage at 1.55 p.m. Eastern time, so in about five minutes. Thank you all.